I, 36 male, heard my wife, 40 female, and her partner insulting me during sex, and I'm seriously questioning our future together. I have been in ethical non-monogamy with my, 36 male, wife, 40 female, for over a decade. We've had our ups and downs, but generally, it's been great. We have our rules, the most fundamental of which is that even in the context of ethical non-monogamy, we would always operate on a bedrock foundation of mutual respect for each other and each other's partners. We never got hung up on the, not in our bed, nonsense. If my wife has a date, I'd rather she be in her own space where she feels safe and in control and where she knows I have access in case anything goes wrong. We both take partners back to our home regularly, we have no kids, so there's no problem there. We had agreed that if one of us gets home and the other is there with a partner, then we don't disturb the date and just wait until it's over. We've also always gotten off on listening in on each other when this happens, which anyone we bring back home is made fully aware of. Usually, we all have a drink together afterwards. I got to my house, and she was there with her longest-term partner, who has been in our lives for about six years at this point. They didn't know I was in the house, and I started listening from the landing, they were talking about me in an incredibly humiliating way. He would give her prompts, asking her questions about how pathetic and useless I am, and she would agree, about how I can't engage sexually and am a poor husband, and she would agree and pile on with name-calling and degrading comments about me. For what it's worth, I know it's part of a power-slash-humiliation dynamic, but I don't care, I was furious. It's not an ego thing, I know I'm a good, attentive husband, and if I can allow myself a moment of conceit, I'm a pretty good partner as well. I would never tolerate any partner of mine saying negative things about my wife, and I would never participate in anything that humiliates her, even if she's not there. At no point in our ethical non-monogamy journey did I consent to becoming the object of my wife's derision and disrespect when she's on a date, especially with her closest and longest running partner. I walked into the bedroom, a big mistake, and told him to leave. My wife was livid and said, no, he's not going anywhere, but I put my foot down and asked him to leave the house. We had a massive argument, she told me I was being unreasonable, I told her she doesn't respect me, and some harsh words were exchanged from both sides. That was Tuesday night, and we haven't really spoken since, I certainly won't be the first to make contact, and she's been staying at his place all week, which is a major violation of our ground rules, but I also broke them by asking him to leave. For 13 years, I've worshipped the ground she walks on, and I refuse to accept the way they talk about me, even in the heat of the moment. It's not right, and I won't stand for it. It's really put the future of our marriage into question because I won't move forward with him still in the picture, and that will cause a volcanic amount of friction, she really likes him and has known him for almost half the time she's known me. It would severely disrupt our system, and I know she would resent me for it, but I also know I will resent her if he stays. I feel steadfast in this, but I'd appreciate a sanity check before I make any drastic moves. My spouse came home last night, and we had a very long and incredibly difficult conversation. She texted me yesterday and asked if it was okay with me if she came home after work. I said it's her home too, and that I'd been waiting for her for three days. There's no way I could go through everything that was said, so I'll just summarize what I feel were my biggest takeaways. Basically, there was some good and some bad and were taking baby steps on crackling ice. As soon as she walked in the door and saw me, she broke down and started apologizing. For what they said, for what she said afterward, and for leaving, all of it. The derogatory talk about me has been going on for nearly two years. Started around the time COVID lockdowns were relaxing so we could see friends with benefits again. She had told him she'd missed him during sex the first time they met back up, he told her yeah because all she's had in lockdown is me and it escalated from there. They don't do it regularly, just from time to time, and she was mortified that I had heard it. She said she never meant any of that stuff, but it turns him on, and the sex is better as a result. The man has his own major insecurities, apparently, and she had taken it upon herself to make him feel more like a man, and she never thought I'd ever hear or be hurt by it. The way she phrased it was that when they talk like that, it pretty much tends to be around stuff that he doesn't feel he measures up about, and she always knows it's false and has never spoken a bad word about me outside that headspace. Her initial burst of anger when I barged into the bedroom, she says, came from a place of extreme embarrassment and shame. I should note that while we do get off on listening, we never watch each other. We've tried a few times, but there's something about the visual that rubbed us both the wrong way, so we stopped. 
So for her, when I walked in, it was kind of like a parent busting in on you masturbating to some messed up porn. It is also true that when I walked in, he did have her in a very vulnerable position, performing a humiliating sex act on her, so I see how that could have made her erupt in shame. Upon reflection, it may also be possible that seeing her in that compromised position added to my own anger in that moment as well. She was also feeling embarrassed on behalf of the guy, that she wasn't able to provide a safe place for him, and blamed me in the moment for embarrassing them both. This also fueled her defensiveness afterward and her refusal to back down or concede anything. I'd made her feel like a whore, apparently. She apologized unreservedly for not acknowledging my feelings on the night and for not apologizing straight away. She regrets the things she said during our big fight and says that I was totally right to feel the way I did and that she was just feeling humiliated and cornered, but she knows I must have felt even worse. I asked her if she loved him. Of course not, she says. They have great sexual chemistry, and she cares about him a lot, but they would never be compatible in real life, and not once has she ever contemplated a future with him. It somehow upset her that I would think that. However, she confessed that she has known for over a year that he has been in love with her since at least before the pandemic. He tells her frequently, but she never says it back. She said that it made their time together more intimate and enjoyable, and since she knew she could never reciprocate his feelings, it wasn't a threat. She's made it clear to him plenty of times that a future between them isn't on the cards. This part has been really difficult for me to process. She said they would stop that kind of talk going forward. I said he was not good enough, I want him out. She started crying and said she feared I would want that but hoped I wouldn't. She asked if there's any way they might be able to continue. I said she could hang out with him all she wants, but she'd be doing it as a single woman. She cried, but she agreed to break things off. She asked if they could meet up one more time because they never got the chance to say bye. I agreed on the condition that they leave me out of it and that she make it clear to him that that will be the last time they ever even speak. Any further contact of any kind after that will be the end of us. I should also note that in our subsequent fight that night, at one point I did say something like, well, why don't you just leave to his place then? In a rhetorical way that you sometimes do in a heated argument, and in a moment of pettiness, she said, fine, I will and packed a bag and went. She spent the first night with him out of spite, but they did not have sex, and she would not have stayed any further nights except he went away for work, so she had his place to herself. Out of pride, she was holding out and waiting for me to make contact before coming back, just as I was. We had to take around a half hour break when I told her I had gone as far as making an appointment with an attorney for next week. She didn't handle that well at all and had a severe panic attack. She said she never imagined that would ever be on the cards, and that she would have come home days ago if she thought I was even remotely thinking about it. She can't imagine life without me. Finally, I asked her how I'm supposed to believe the things she's telling me or if she's full of them. She said she promises she's being truthful, and she's never broken a promise to me before, which is true. So I'm inclined to mostly believe her explanations, but there are still a lot of things I need to work through, process, ask about, and convince myself of. We decided we would close the marriage for a couple of months to focus on our own relationship and then reassess. I've cancelled my meeting with the lawyer, and we're going to go to counseling. Any suggestions on how to find non-monogamy friendly therapists would be helpful. I never thought we'd ever be here, so I have no idea where to start looking. She offered to close her side unilaterally and let me keep seeing my partners, but this is about both of us. I'm not interested in having her punish herself for the sake of it, I still have to figure out if 1, I really fully believe what she told me and 2, if I'm satisfied to continue. I'll take our time while we're together to make up my mind. It'll be tough, but I'm willing to at least try and work on it. I've been stealing myself for divorce all week, so that's the mindset I've been in, and I acknowledge that I owe it at least to the relationship we had to give it a hard try. Edit. A lot of you in the comments have been asking why I would ever allow one final date between them, especially a private one. I've given some explanation in replies, but I feel it might be worth expanding on. Believe me, I've considered a lot of the same things that you've mentioned, why would she even? My cousin female 20 for falsely accused me male 31 of sexual assault. Now my family is contacting me after almost 10 years. I first posted this on relationships and it got removed, and I got no answer when I tried to get them to check it manually. Please note that no one involved is under 18 anymore.
And the situation did not involve sexual abuse. That's the whole point. Hi. I've never had an account on Reddit before. But someone on another forum linked to this subreddit, and I've been reading some stories. If this is the wrong subreddit, please let me know. Also, English is not my first language, so bear with me. It's pretty much what the title says. I just feel so lost on what to do. This is tearing up wounds, and old rage is building again. Let me give some background. I've grown up in what was probably the most normal of normal households. Parents worked a lot but still managed to care for me and my three older sisters. We were never super close as a family, but we never had any issues either. The same goes for my extended family. They always lived a few hours away, but we saw each other during the summer holidays or Christmas and always got along great. But as we got older, we naturally grew apart as everyone had their own lives. I'm 31 now, in 2014. When I was 22 and attending university, I got a phone call from my mother that turned my life upside down. I remember I didn't even answer at first because I was gaming with friends, but she called again immediately after the first call. This was an unwritten rule in the family. If you call twice like that, it's important. Like someone died important. So when she called again, I excused myself and answered, only to hear chaos on the other end, like people were arguing. But when my mom realized I had answer, it sounded like she went to another room and closed the door. I just asked what was going on, and I heard she was crying. My memory of this conversation is a bit blurry. But she basically asked me if I had something to confess to regarding E. E is my cousin on my mom's side, and is seven years younger than me, who was 15 at the time. At that point, I hadn't even seen E for several years, I just said no and asked what this was about. She just cried even harder and started accusing me of sexually assaulting E back when we were children. That he had told everything to my sister, and that my sister told my mother and my aunt. He had told them that back when she was 9 and I was 16. She'd been playing in my room when I came in and started feeling her under her clothes and kissing her. My mother screamed at me to say something, but I couldn't even speak. It was all so absurd. I remember thinking that must be a bad joke. The last thing I remember saying was that it's not true and that he is lying. But then my mom goes on, saying that he gave such a detailed description of where and how. Then she kept asking something like, did you do this? Did you do this? And I just screamed back at her. No, each time. It all ended with my mom putting me on speaker and both my mom and dad saying that they don't want anything to do with me and never to contact them again. Two of my sisters texted me later that day, pretty much saying that I'm disgusting, and then blocked me. I know it's weird, but after that call, I went to have a long shower. To this day, I still don't know why I did that. After calming down, I started calling and texting everyone. Even he no one answered. And the ones who hadn't blocked my number by then quickly did so. The only thing I heard back was from my father, who texted me to stop contacting them, and that they needed to heal. That was 9 years ago, and I haven't spoken to anyone in my family since that day. To say this f asterisk ckd me up is an understatement. I was living in a haze for weeks after that and hardly ate at all. It didn't help that this was right before I was supposed to defend my bachelor's thesis and was already stressed out. Luckily, my co-writer sent something was up and saved me by controlling the conversation so that I got the easy parts, without him, I'm sure I would have failed, needless to say, no one came to my graduation, then started the worst period of my life, I spent the first year expecting the cops to knock on my door and arrest me for sexual abuse, I didn't land any jobs, I just lived off my saved money, I drank a lot and did oxy, I also grew resentful and violent, the only reason I didn't hurt anyone was because no one was around, my neighbor called the cops on me once after I had smashed a glass, but I managed to convince the officers that I had just dropped it. And they went away since there were no others inside my apartment. Instead of sleeping, I spent my nights planning how I could hurt Ian and make sure no one ever found out. Even thinking about how I could actually do the things she'd accused me of. But much worse, I know. I'm not proud of that. I landed my first real job in my field in late 2015. Only then did things start to improve. I focused all my time on my job, as it gave me something normal to do. Recovery was a slow process. But I drank less sober now for four years and smiled more. I lived cheap and earned good money, so I made a point of buying myself a nice gift for my birthdays, a VR headset, a motorcycle, Lego, ETC. And last year, I moved from my shitty apartment and bought a small house. It was an old dream of mine to have my own garage and a garden to care for. This has boosted me even more, so my life is okay now, I still have problems. I've been on antidepressants for the last few years, and while they help, it's not in a happy way. They simply remove the dark thoughts and replace them with dead ones. My trust in other people is close to non-existent. I've tried dating, 
but only on two dates with two different women. It's really hard to speak like a normal person when it comes down to it. And what would I tell a potential partner when she asked about my family? Oh, you know, they accused me of a heinous crime. And we're not talking anymore. But I didn't do it, I swear. My field is very male-dominated. So the only woman I really speak to is my therapist, who I like a lot. If this text was difficult to follow, I apologize. I'm not good with words on the best of days. And I started rambling a bit when it all came back to me. It's already getting long, so I will fast forward to my current issue. A few days ago, I received a text from my mother. It felt unreal, and I was scared to open it at first. So I just stared at the notification for hours before opening it. Yesterday, another text followed, translated. They basically say, text one, hi, my name greater than. It's been so long since we talked, we miss you and want to know how you're doing. Here she writes a long text about my sisters and how my nieces and nephews are getting big. I didn't even know I was an uncle, know that we love you and always will. Mom and dad text too. Hi, my name we understand if you don't want to talk to us after what happened, but please listen. Last month, the subject of you was brought up at a family gathering. During this, he was downplaying everything that had happened to her. It got so awkward that she finally admitted that nothing happened and that she probably just dreamt it. We were all appalled by this. When we last spoke, we wanted to protect the and did the only thing we thought we could do. We know that's not an excuse for how you were treated. What he did was wrong, and we were all angry at her. We have called everyone who knew and told them the truth. We all want to speak with you. And your sisters want you to meet their families. Please write back if you can find it in you to forgive us. Mom and Dad so yeah. That's my situation right now. I haven't answered, but they no doubt know I've seen it. Truth be told, I'm seeing things. So many old, shitty memories are now stirring again. I don't want to forgive them, and I wouldn't trust myself to be in the same room as them right now. Part of me wants to call my family and unleash everything on them, to guilt them with everything I went through until they all hit rock bottom, then dedicate my life to making my cousins' lives as miserable as possible. The other part wants to ignore them, and continue with my okayish life with my motorcycle and my garden to keep me company. I don't have any friends, the only people I speak to are my co-workers, but we're not really close. I've called my therapist's clinic, but they told me she's on vacation and won't be available for weeks, and I don't want anyone else but her. So that leaves internet strangers, so please, where do I go from here? Do I ignore them, and continue as is, or do I answer? And if so, what should I even write? I'm pretty sure meeting them, in person, would be a bad idea for a foreseeable future. But I'm not even sure how my life can improve from picking up those old threads. As embarrassing as it may sound, I've dreamed about the day when they apologized for throwing themselves to the ground and kissing my feet. Texting seems so anticlimactic now. TL. Doctor my cousin falsely accused me of sexually assaulting her when we were minors. And I was disowned. Now it has been revealed that it never happened. And my family is contacting me and wants to make amends. I don't know how to respond. Edit. Holy. Shasterist T. I went to bed yesterday after answering a couple of comments. I was happy then when someone just said to wait for the therapist to come back something that had flown over my head. Now there are 1300 comments, I can't possibly answer all. But I'll try to read them all when I get home from work. I just want to address something I saw a few people mention. My therapist wouldn't leave for that long without telling me. I don't know how this works in other places, but this is a state-run clinic. There is no hourly rate or anything. I got assigned to her when first going there, which means she will continue to get me in the meetings that follow. But that is not 100%. If she's on leave or sick, I might get someone else. Four to six weeks of vacation is not uncommon. Edit 2. Some people have messaged me about an update video on TikTok. Please note that this is not by me. All I have written you can see on this page. My spouse, 31 female, and I, 33 male, have been together for 13 years and have two children. Our relationship is good, except in the intimacy department. Four years, I felt like there was a gap between us in that regard, so I tried everything I could think of, and when that failed, I read books and watched videos, doing what all the experts say. All the while, I have been very vocal about wanting to have sex, and trying to make her interested. However, she has always been resistant to all my advances and suggestions. Every time I ask, what she wants or likes, she has no answers. Four years, she denied not finding me attractive. She always said it was just the way she was, and it wasn't going to change. All the time saying she loved me, and that she found me attractive. A few months ago, I put it all in her court. I told her that I didn't understand what was going on, and she needed to figure it out because I was done trying. A couple of nights later, after the kids were asleep, 
She came to the kitchen to talk. I expressed how I felt, and she lost it. She said that I was going to divorce her, and had wasted her time. I sat there calmly, and said I wanted none of those things. I want to go to couples counseling. The next day, while sitting on the couch having a calm, earnest conversation, she said, I've never found you physically attractive. I don't know what to do now. We are going to see a therapist soon. I feel devastated and in deep sorrow for me, her, and our children. Why would she be with someone she doesn't like on a basic level? Why did she waste her time here? Sorry for emptying my face. I hope this was coherent. The TLD or wife is not attracted to me. Me sad. What do I do? I, female, 32, am considering cheating on my partner, male, 30, after nearly four years of little to no intimacy. I've been with my boyfriend for nearly six years. We were really intimate for the first one to two years, regularly one to three times per week. Something to note. Early in our relationship, he found out his ex had given him human papillomavirus, HPV, which he had passed on to me. We got it checked out and sorted slash managed, and I understood it wasn't something he did purposefully. When COVID hit, we were living together in a flat, and there was a lot going on, so our sexual life dropped off here, and I didn't think much of it for six months. After that, I talked to him, and he said he was feeling self-conscious because he was putting weight on and wanted to lose it before he could feel confident enough to be intimate again. I said okay, and went to the gym slash home workouts with him to help and also get myself back into shape. Still, there was nothing. I can count how many times we'd been intimate in a year on one hand. A year and a bit goes by, and I talked to him again, saying we need to work on this, because I need intimacy to feel wanted and needed as well as feel beautiful. He said he loved me and found me beautiful, but he felt shame around the HPV issues. We agreed he would go to therapy, and he did for three months before he quit, saying he was fine now. Another six months of little to nothing, and I spoke to him again, this time because we were saving for a house, and he was working long hours to get more money, so he was too tired, and we could schedule something in weekly. I hate scheduling intimacy, but agreed and agreed to include toys and tying up, so he was more into it. Well, the night arrived, and he was two hours late home. By the time he reheated and ate dinner, he then said he needed to go on his Xbox and decompress, because it had been a long day. I went to bed and cried. Cut to now, the same pattern occurs. I talk to him, he says he loves me, and finds me beautiful, and it's all him. He says he will work on it, we come up with ideas, and then when it comes to the day, he doesn't show up, has an excuse, or just says no. I blew up at him yesterday, when he missed our intimacy night for dinner with his parents, he sees them two to three times per week. I told him if this continued, I would start seeking intimacy elsewhere because I can't go on like this, and it feels like we are just roommates and not in a relationship. He got angry and looked so hurt. He said he couldn't believe I would say I would cheat on him, and he is now not talking to me. I'm at my wit's end, I don't know what to do. I've been supportive and patient for four years, and now I can't stand it anymore. Before you think about it as well, he isn't cheating on me, I have 100% trust in him, and he isn't gay or closet gay, we have genuinely talked about it. I feel like he might be asexual, but how the heck do you bring that up? Anyway, any suggestions? Please help, I feel like an AH, but I'm also desperate to have some intimacy. My husband's affair partner is facing consequences. I discovered that my husband's affair partner is facing some consequences. She got fired from her job possibly due to a negative review one wrote mentioning her name on her workplace's website. Then she lost another job she got afterward. Additionally, she's getting evicted from her apartment due to the drama she started, and her boyfriend left her, making it difficult for her to afford it. Furthermore, her friend, whom she planned to move in with, abandoned her because she didn't want to be in a throuple with the friend and her husband. I learned all this from her ex-boyfriend who is now sending me flowers despite never doing so for her. Everyone says revenge isn't worth it, and I should move on and block everyone. But to be honest, this feels pretty satisfying. This affair partner wasn't just some random person unaware of my husband's marriage. She was a good friend of mine. I welcomed her into my home when she was having issues with her boyfriend, and I was a supportive friend to her. Yet she and my husband had an affair behind my back. Lying and gaslighting me about it, it felt personal. And honestly, I haven't felt this good since before all this happened. Maybe that's wrong of me. But I believe she deserves these consequences for everything she did. She also lacks family or friends. I might feel sorry for her if she wasn't the worst person I've ever met in my life. Am I the jerk for kicking out my son-in-law for bringing 
Salad, like I asked. I have a son-in-law, let's call him Jeff, that I do not get along with. I find him to be incompetent, and I am not going to pretend about that. He is a prankster, and for the most part, they are harmless if not annoying. Instead of me cooking a ton for get-togethers, we do a potluck. We have a shared document where I list items that need to be brought, like salad, chicken dish, dessert, and so on. People will put their names next to the items they are bringing. My daughter travels often, so there have been multiple times where he has come alone. This is where issues arise. He will sign up for an item and then bring in a joke version. He signed up to bring a fish entree and brought in candy sushi. Well, many hate chicken, so they didn't have an entree to eat. He claims he will bring in lasagna, and it was a cake. I have talked to him, and multiple members of the family have. My daughter said she would handle it, but she can't stop him when she is gone. It's a problem since his lying makes it so we run out of entree food, and now I have to cook more. It also annoys other members, since they usually go home hungry. Really, the first time was funny, and now it's just annoying. This time I asked him to just bring a salad, and sign up for the salad. He can buy a kit at Walmart, but please bring a salad. He came to the event with a bowl of candy and called it a candy salad. I kicked him out, and started making a salad for dinner. He is pissed. My daughter and he are calling me a jerk for kicking him out. Am I the jerk for not being grateful when wife buys gifts for me that are actually for her a few years ago? My spouse bought me a hammock for my birthday, even though I had never shown interest in one. It was clear that she wanted it for herself. I found it odd but brushed it off, thinking she misunderstood my preferences. Then, a year later, she gifted me a lawn mower for my birthday, which I had no desire for but was a practical household item we needed. I felt annoyed, likening it to buying her a dishwasher for her birthday. This year, with our new car, she insisted on getting seat covers despite my clear disinterest and objections. Yet again, they were my birthday present. Am I in the wrong here I feel frustrated and disrespected, but whenever I try to express my feelings, I get guilt tripped. I'm starting to doubt my own perception of reality. Additional info, for her birthdays, I've gifted experiences like a kayak trip, along with sentimental items like custom made hoodies and necklaces. I even got her a star galaxy projector this year because she loves stargazing about to get a divorce. I just joined this sub a few days ago, and I will say it's been comforting reading some of the posts here. I'm hoping this will be of some use to someone going through what I am. I'm 40, male, and she's 43. We've been together for 14 years, married for 11 years, and actually, it's her birthday today, so Valentine's never is about me, which is fine. Anyway, we have been living together and sleeping in separate beds since we decided to get a divorce in September. Our plan was to let our son finish the school year, then put the house up for sale and go our separate ways. We've been on the verge of divorce before, when I actually moved out. I found out she was crushing over some man she met one weekend, to the point where, she couldn't stop thinking about him and couldn't breathe, her e-exact words. She said nothing happened between them, and they met at a weekend music festival and hung out all weekend, but by then she was smitten for him. To say I was devastated was an understatement. I literally cried every day for a month, I would have to pull over on the side of the road coming home from work because of the tears. When I met my wife, I was a little unsure and slow to really show my feelings since she had recently divorced the previous year. I took it slow. But after a year, we moved in together and haven't been apart for more than a week in 14 years. She was my best friend. I never met a woman I could truly be myself around and not try to be controlled or turn into something I'm not. She was just a cool hang, and we clicked on so many levels. Music was what we bonded over the most. Anyway, we are getting close to the end of the road, and I'm starting to get really sad, angry, worried, and scared. Our son is our only disagreement right now. He wants to come live with me, but she is fighting me on it and says he doesn't have a choice. He will be 11 next school year and is a mature 11 year old, so I feel like he should get to decide where he will be most comfortable. I work, and she doesn't. I pay all the bills, both physically and financially. In fact, she's moving back in with her parents when we divorce because she doesn't have anywhere to go, which means he will be living with them. We were doing this without an attorney as well, since I've agreed to give her whatever she wants except my son full time. My son is the only thing keeping me going right now. Here's the point of all this, I feel like something more is going on with her than she's telling me. 
I feel like there's someone out there she's going to connect with once this is over. She changed all her passwords to everything she has because we both knew each other's passwords. I'm all for transparency in a relationship. I have nothing to hide, but it's weird what she does all of a sudden, or maybe she wants privacy. What should I do about my son? How long until the worry of seeing her with someone else goes away? When will I be happy again? Christian men don't cheat. Being cheated on has left me in a weird place with my faith. I grew up hearing that you need to marry a man who loves Jesus more than he loves you because there are certain things he won't do, like cheat, not just because he loves you, but because he fears God. Ireland you shouldn't marry an unbeliever because what's going to keep them from cheating on you when they don't love God? Surely they don't have any morals, and premarital sex is about the worst thing you could do. Well, obviously, those things were such nonsense. There are some atheists who are probably more faithful because of their own personal morals. I'm not saying I'm completely walking away from my faith, but I don't know. It just makes me feel like if I could do it all over, I would just live my life. I passed on people because I believed that nonsense and life could have been different for me. If I is unsuccessful, I don't know if I'm going down that road again. Sign me up for the premarital sex and the agnostics, at least I'll have realistic expectations. Also, I'm not saying that the only reason I believed in what I believed in was to get a good husband, but it just feels like if that part was nonsense, it makes me feel like what else was. Am I the asshole for not carrying on another family's tradition? In our house, we have two birthdays coming up. My wife's son Marcel turning 16, and her daughter Marcellini turning 13, asking them what they want for their birthday. They both said that just the normal gift was great, seeing that I was confused. My wife helpfully reminded me of the traditional luggage gift, and then I realized there was a family tradition of giving kids a luggage set for their 16th birthday. Yes, but that was my ex-wife's family, not mine. I was never even involved. It was always a thing for them, a few decades ago. One of my ex's sisters got a job at a high-end luggage company and took over for the next generation of the family my daughter and her cousins because she could get it for really cheap with her discount. My daughter is the youngest of the kids on that side and around the time she was turning 13. Between the aunt knowing she would be retiring soon and some personal drama, they decided to give my daughter her sep for her 13th birthday so she wouldn't be left out. I've always thought that tradition was impractical and an excessive amount of money to spend. Even $1,000 is way too much to spend on luggage for anyone, especially a child. I wouldn't spend that much on myself. I tried to tell them all this. My wife thinks that by letting my daughter participate by accepting the gift, I've made it my family tradition as well. And now I'm just singling her kids out. I'm not. Not caring about her accepting a gift from her own nance doesn't mean I don't still think it's impractical. There's a lot of difference between you can't have this because it's not worth buying, and you can't have this because I think it's inappropriate or dangerous. Also, it would be even more expensive for us to buy it for them than even the aunt spent on my daughter. My daughter's set cost me zero dollars, and her aunt one thousand dollars as she had a discount. Buying the other kids' sets would cost me two thousand dollars each, so for thousand dollars, now everyone is upset at me because I'm apparently making it clear that I don't care about Marcel and Marcellini as much as my daughter because I'm breaking tradition and telling them they don't deserve anything that my daughter had. Am I wrong for thinking this is ridiculous? I, Tia, for asking my cousin to move the date of his second wedding. My 29-year-old cousin Frankie, 33-year-old, and his wife Nora, 32-year-old, have been married for almost 15 years. They got married a couple weeks after Nora's 18th birthday last weekend. They announced to the family at a get-together that they were having a second wedding in September, as they were now in a position where they could afford to finally celebrate their marriage with friends and family the way they wanted to. When they married originally, it was just the two of them and two friends at the courthouse. But Nora had always wanted a big, fancy white wedding. Now, usually this wouldn't be a problem. I'm happy for Frankie and Nora and excited to get to attend their wedding. However, the date they've picked is the day before my wedding. My fiancé, 29 and I have been together for nine years and have been planning our wedding for the last three years. We've had our date and venue booked for two years. Our save the dates only went out last month. When they announced their date, I asked Nora privately if they were joking about the date they had picked. Nora looked at me really confused until I pointed out they were having their second wedding, the day before my wedding. Nora told me that the date they'd chosen was the date they'd met in high school, and it was an important date to them. Later on, Frankie asked me why I wasn't happy for them, and I told him that it was rude of them to have their second wedding, the day before mine. I told him that he had essentially ruined my wedding because no one is going to attend two weddings in a row on a weekend, especially not our elderly grandparents. Frankie apologized and said he didn't know our wedding date when they booked it, 
he told me that they weren't going to move the date and had the gall to suggest that I move my wedding if it mattered that much to me. I snapped and told him that it was tacky to have a redo wedding because they decided to get married on a whim at 18 with barely a penny between them. Frankie got mad at me, and he and Nora left shortly after. That night, Frankie and my aunt, his mom, sent me angry messages, telling me that I knew why they got married so young. Nora came from an abusive household, she was essentially the punching bag for her brother, and her mother let the abuse continue. They married because Nora and Frankie saw it as their only way out. My aunt and Frankie have since told other family members, who are mostly mad, that I suggested Frankie move his second wedding. Some think that, given that he's already married, he should move on. I Tia for asking my cousin to move the date of his wedding. E Tia, my save the dates didn't go out until last month. However, my family has been aware of it since we booked it. We've got a family group chat that Frankie is in, and I posted it there. I 26 female kicked my soon-to-be ex-friend 25 female out of my house. As the title says, last week I kicked what I thought was a good friend out of my house because I could no longer handle her antics. I just want to write it here to de-stress and deal with the grief of losing a friend. Kendall 25 female and I met in university in 2016. We studied different majors but were from the same department, so we shared many classes together and bonded over our passion for gaming and memes. Upon graduation, Kendall moved back to her hometown due to COVID and found a job there. We kept in touch online through INSTagram. About three years later, Kendall told me she found a better paying job in the city, so she's planning to move out of her parents' place. When I asked her about her plans for her accommodations, she replied, that's the thing, I was going to ask if you have an extra bedroom that I could move into. For context, I inherited an apartment from my late grandfather, which was a nice three-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment near the city center last January. I currently live alone there since it is closer to my workplace and has all the conveniences of public transport. After some thinking, I thought that there's no harm in living with Kendall since I consider us close friends. We discussed the terms and, of course, the rent. A week later, Kendall moved into my apartment. It was great at first, my home felt more lively than usual, and the thought of going home to a close friend warmed my heart and gave me a sense of security. Things were okay for a while, and then stuff went downhill super quick. Kendall started complaining about many things at home, about her work, her savings, and how she feels homesick. At first, I was very accommodating, thinking maybe she just needed time to get used to city life. I offered as much help as I could, even to the point that if she's low on money, I don't mind voiding a month's rent if it meant I could help her achieve financial stability. I taught her how to save money and how to live off of my then low salary with several commitments like my car, my dog, and a student loan. I grew up where my parents expected me to be independent, so I told her things I'd do when I'm low on cash, like how to get freelance jobs, etc., but she always seems to have excuses for every suggestion I have. Finding a freelance job is too hard, or how she couldn't let go of her premium junk food, that she isn't willing to cook or meal prep and I eventually decided to leave it as it is. And after two months of living together, I realized Kendall started treating me as some kind of competition. She would constantly ask me things like how much money I make a month and how many job hoppings that take place. Anything that she thinks she's better than me, she'll definitely pop that question. She boasts about how she is loyal to her SHTTY paying company and how I would never be able to move up the corporate ladder, as she called me an industry frog. She once snooped my savings balance and asked how the heck I had so much saved up with commitments, etc. Mind you, she didn't have a lot of commitments since her parents paid off her student loans and fully paid off a brand new car for her and maybe I should stop collecting rent from her. I got mad and told her if she wasn't happy living with me, maybe she should move out. Q crocodile tears as she said it was a joke. I didn't have to take her seriously. She begged for forgiveness and promised to never snoop on my personal items and details again. I let it go once, but she kept bringing things up, like, well, you have the cash and a credit card, every time I told her I would rather stay home because I no longer have the budget to go out and have fun. 
Comments like these became more frequent when I got a new job six months ago. On top of that, she doesn't clean up after herself, tried to flirt with my boyfriend, and at times parked in my parking space when our initial agreement was that she has to find her own parking space if she's moving in with her own car because my apartment only has one parking lot per unit. The straw that broke the camel's back was when I caught her kicking my dog in the abdomen when I got home from work. I yelled at her and rushed to check on my dog, luckily, he was fine, but I still rushed him to the vet for safety measures. I got home, and she sneered that it was just a dog, and as a friend, I shouldn't treat her like that. I asked why she'd kicked my dog, and she didn't answer me. She shrugged and tried to escape into her room. At this point, it had already been about a year since Kendall moved in with me. I lost my cool and told her off bringing up her problems and how I tried to be nice and accommodating. Then I told her I'm giving her a week to move out and that from then on I would rather we keep our relationship casual or we don't ever talk at all. Kendall cried and begged me to not kick her out, but soon it turned into her screaming back at me, calling me a bad friend because apparently, in her words, I didn't tell her off on how badly she was behaving like, what the heck. There was a lot of back and forth and I don't remember what I said, but I remember eventually calling her an entitled brat. She cried again, saying it was uncalled for, and stormed off to her room. The next day, I was bombarded with texts from other university friends, some calling me selfish and others sympathizing with me. Apparently, Kendall posted our argument on Facebook and Instagram, painting me as the bad guy. I was upset at first but I decided that after Kendall moved out, we would no longer be friends, as would those who took her side of the story and condemned me. Last week, Kendall left, and I changed the locks on my apartment. I curled up in bed and cried myself out, probably from the sadness of losing a friend, or maybe I am finally letting out all the frustrations. I am definitely still grieving about this loss of a friend, as I've had many good times with Kendall. For now, I want to focus on myself, and hopefully I will eventually get over this. Edit, the whole teasing that I have more money than Kendall got worse when I told her I was given an offer by an MNC as a senior designer, and I disclosed to her the offered salary as we always did, like I know how much she earns too, which was about 50% more than hers. That was dumb on my part. I now understand why my parents told me to never disclose or discuss salaries the moment I started working. Update, I kicked my soon-to-be ex-friend out of my house. For those who haven't seen the original post, you may read it here for context. Hello everyone, I'm here with some updates about me and my doggo, as well as my now ex-friend, Kendall. Let's start off with an update about myself. I've been doing well, and surprisingly, as some of you mentioned previously, I've gotten over the loss of this friendship rather quickly. My boyfriend planned a trip to a pet-friendly beachfront hotel, and I spent a few days with just my boyfriend and doggo. We played in the sea water, and I watched my dog play in the sand. Overall, we had a great time, and we even had grilled fish together while watching the sunset. Doggo had a deboned fish fillet. I am also grateful for my friends who stood by my side regarding this issue. They check in on me from time to time and send me funny content to watch during my free time. Some of them even told me their stories about Kendall and their discontentment with her behavior, of which I will list some below. Friend A, Kendall ridiculed Friend A several times because Friend A earned less than Kendall, despite working a year longer than Kendall. Friend B, Kendall trash talked Friend B's company via Instagram just because Kendall flunked her interview with said company with flying colors. Friend C, Kendall always demands that Friend C be her personal driver during our college days. If Friend C refuses, Kendall will guilt trip her. Friend D, ruined Friend D's assignment by pranking him. She actually formatted his laptop when the project was due in two weeks. When confronted, all Kendall said was oh oopsies. There are many more, but these are the more icky ones I've heard from my friends. And now with that out of the way, here is today's main course, after I kicked Kendall out of my house, one of my university friends, let's call her Anne, 
stood by Kendall's version of events and has allowed Kendall to move in with her instead. Anne called me out of the blue this afternoon, and her first question to me was, how on earth did you manage to put up with Kendall for a year she's driving me crazy? Long story short, whatever Kendall did when she was living with me, she now does it to Anne. Snooping Anne's personal items, leaving dirty laundry around, generally being a prick in the buttocks Anne told me she's planning to force Kendall out of her house too. I didn't comment much since Anne was among those who called me a cruel person, but now it has come back to bite her. But wait, that's not all. According to Anne, Kendall lost her job because she tried to ask for a 100% increment and assaulted her supervisor when the increment request was turned down two weeks ago. She was immediately escorted out of the office building by security. And she just texted me 20 minutes ago, saying she needed a favor from me and that she wants a job at my workplace. I replied, stating there isn't any vacancy. To be honest, even if there is, I wouldn't hire her. So yeah, I hope this is the last time I hear from Kendall, and I'll only update if somehow something interesting happens that involves Kendall. Does do not enter mean nothing to people? So I work at a resort and employees share the same parking spaces as guests and visitors. Like with any place, finding a convenient parking spot that is close to where you're going can either be super easy or super annoying. Sometimes, you're just going to have to park a 10-minute walk away because the main lot is full. Sometimes you get lucky, the main lot is empty, and you can choose wherever you want to park. That's just life. However, some people end up finding a third option, which is parking in a place they're not supposed to be in, which is our resort's dirt lot. In our town, cars are forbidden from parking on unpaved areas unless the property is given permission and received a fine for disobeying. This included the dirt lot, which gets its name from the fact that it's made of dirt. But fines haven't stopped people from parking there, so our security department put up an iron barricade and a do not enter sign to keep people from entering. And even still people park there, people will literally take the time to move the barricade so they can park there. Last summer, one of my co-workers got into serious trouble because he damaged the barricade by throwing it to the side. They figured out it was him because of his license plate and a sticker with his name was on the back of the car. Not only was this kid, who was 19, facing a fine for parking illegally, but also got a visit by the head of security himself who threatened him with paying for damages to company property if he did that again. It was a sight to behold. I decided to share this story now because one of the major managers of the resort sent an entire email out about employees moving the barricade so they could park on the dirt lot. Seriously, why take the time to do that? Is a 10-minute walk really worth the threat of a fine and possible write-ups from your workplace? Edit, I thought I mentioned this, and I might have deleted it by accident, but the reason parking on dirt is illegal is due to a city ordinance. The ordinance basically prohibits cars from parking anywhere that isn't properly paved to the city's standards. There's a few exceptions, though, which is how we're sometimes able to park there. I think my entitled friend intentionally tried to make me feel sad that I'm alone for Valentine's Day. Both my friend and I are in relationships. I'm engaged to the love of my life but with that we have to be apart for a bit. My fiancé and I are doing the K-1 fiancé visa, so we have to be apart for a year max, but luckily the government is making it go by fast so it most likely will be under a year. The long distance is very hard on me and us, but we are making it through. Luckily I have a lot of work vacations, and I'm seeing him on Sunday for the whole week, in London and then in August I'm spending a month in his home country of South Korea. My friend is in a toxic on and off again relationship. They are honestly a match made in hell. She has told me her boyfriend was cheating on her, with a lesbian and she made these claims for a while. Regarding cheating she has said he was going to cheat on her during her birthday. With all, the cheating, they always seem to get back together. She goes from telling me how horrible he is to being the happiest girl alive. Since today is Valentine's Day I encouraged myself not to give it much thought so I won't make myself sad that my fiancé isn't here today. We first-timed, made lovely Instagram posts, and told each other how much we love each other. I planned just to have a night to myself, watch some horror movies, and have some popcorn. My friend called me and I knew right away she would start bragging about her plans. When I answered the phone she said, Hey girl I'm just checking in on you, since you don't have Valentine's Day with your man, and I said, Oh yeah I'm fine I honestly don't care since I'm seeing him in a few days. Luckily, the conversation changed but she kept going into detail about Valentine's Day. I just told myself to let her have this and let her go off, but I started to feel like she was playing it up to hurt my feelings like it just felt extra. She told me that her boyfriend bought her a $300 ring, what they are doing for dinner, etc. It was fine initially but she kept repeating herself. Then she said to me that she feels sorry for me, that I'm alone for Valentine's Day.
Valentine's Day. That hurt to hear, but I just said, I really don't care. I guess I tried to push the narrative that I don't care. Then her brother walked past, who's also my friend. She asked him what's his Valentine's Day plans. He said his plans are doing nothing, and she went off saying that she feels bad that he's not doing anything for Valentine's Day, and she couldn't imagine being alone for Valentine's Day. Her brother just kept repeating herself by telling her the holiday isn't for him, and he doesn't care about it. Funny enough, a few days ago my friend was telling me that she fears her boyfriend won't do anything for Valentine's Day, since according to her, he's not telling her what type of gift he wants and then proceeded to get upset because she didn't want to buy him and Spox. He also told her that Valentine's Day is a white person holiday and blamed white people for taking his money. I told my fiancé about this and he said that he thinks she's doing it intentionally to hurt my feelings and to make me feel upset and jealous. My fiancé has pointed out that she has done stuff like this before and he's not surprised that she would do it again. I tried so hard not to let it affect me, but in a way I does. I don't know if I'm being sensitive or was this actually intentional. I went to the doctor today. A lady in the waiting room had a fussy child and asked the receptionist for a lollipop. She goes up to the counter and sees the basket full of Valentine's candy. Ew. Can I have a couple chocolates? The receptionist kindly holds the basket up. This lady takes a handful and more than half of the basket with her claw-like fingernails. Dozens of chocolates. Jams that into her hoodie pocket. The receptionist was just dazed at the audacity. You took a dang handful, not just a couple. The lady sits down and doesn't even say thanks. That kid is still fussy. And now Baby Shark lives in my brain for the rest of the day. This happened yesterday, and I cannot think about it without shaking and rage. This woman, Karen, was in front of me in a really long line. When there was room on the belt, I put my five items a foot behind her last groceries, and she slammed a divider between her, like I was trying to con her, or something. Here's where the altercation went. Karen hits the $100 cash back option, and the cashier pulls out two fifties and hands them to the woman, saying, have a good day. Karen looked at the cashier like she was the stupidest person in the world. Karen, I wanted twenties. Cashier, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know, but I can't open the register again. This is because Karen never asked for twenties. Karen, well, I don't want this. Asterisk throws money back at the cashier asterisk. The manager gets called over. Karen, this girl didn't ask what bills I wanted. This is ridiculous. Me, well, to be fair, you didn't specify. Karen, excuse me. Me, I said you didn't specify, and you're being insanely rude. Karen, well, she should be asked. Me, well, you don't need to talk to people like that. Karen, it's none of your business. The cashier and manager are clearly stressed out and want this psycho out of the store so I didn't want to keep this going longer than it has to. Me, asterisk muttering under my breath, but able to be heard asterisk you're just being difficult. Not one of my proudest moments. Anyway, we had to wait another 5 minutes because the till didn't have any 20s, probably because this isn't a bank. She ran right to the customer service line, when she got her cash, of course. I just hope she felt a little embarrassed and is scared of being called out next time. She wants to berate a service worker. I know someone might read this and think I'm just a miserable heta, but can I just vent for a second? I find it incredibly irritating how young people get online and record themselves giving life advice. It's worse when they take a short online course and claim they're a life coach. Recently, I saw a girl advertise her weekend workshop by saying, three years of therapy accomplished in three days. I'm sorry, but who do you think you are? There are people who have actually put in the time, energy, money, hard work, etc. to gain education in the field of mental health. A marketing slogan like that completely undermines those who have worked so hard. I feel some of these half as life coaching methods are borderline dangerous, especially to vulnerable populations. It makes me feel pessimistic for the future, seeing a whole generation so incredibly self-conscious and out of touch. Am I an asshole for thinking this? I, a male, 19, have been living with my friend's parents for almost a year now, and I pay rent for my own room. But lately, I've been getting more and more frustrated by the fact that my friend's dad is always intruding on my privacy. For starters, he wanted access to my bank account so that he could help with spending habits, to which I immediately said no because it's my money and he's not my dad. Plus, he already controls my friend's spending, and I don't want that. He also really likes opening my packages, for whatever reason. Even though it's never anything bad, usually just collectibles or figures, I'm getting really tired of always coming home, and finding my packages on my bed, opened. Just yesterday, I came home from some military training, and was super excited to open and set up a cyberpunk edge runner's light on my wall, only to find that it was yet again opened, and completely missing the wall mounts. I asked him politely if he had opened my package, but as per usual, he lied and denied it. Even though I received photos from the delivery driver, and it was clearly him. Later that night, I found the little bag of wall mounts in the trash. I don't really know what to do at this point, I just kind of felt like venting. A guest, 
who apparently has been a top VIP for the past 10 years, called to make a reservation. During the call, I asked a few questions to confirm some details, as I usually do. However, the guest became agitated and started yelling at me, giving me a hard time. I've had interactions with him before where I made mistakes, such as not requiring his ID for check-in. My manager stepped in to address the situation and explained that I'm still new to the role having worked at the place for just over a month. Despite this explanation, the guest remained upset and threatened to report the incident to my manager's boss, whom he claims to know well. While I didn't intend any disrespect, the guest became very upset because I didn't recognize him immediately. Fortunately, my manager is also concerned about the situation and assured me that we would address any potential fallout if the corporate manager were to discuss the incident with me. Elderly neighbor behaves like a child during parking dispute. My house mate and I are in our 20s and live in a unit block with a remote controlled gate and allocated parking spaces. It's pretty common for residents and tradespeople to park in the shared driveway, inside or outside the gate for short periods of time while loading or unloading large items since there's very rarely available street parking nearby and everyone is usually pretty chill about it. My house mate and I are moving and have figured out a way to get both of our cars into the car park to load boxes and furniture so we don't have to be constantly shuffling cars. Our car spot is the one at the farthest end of the car park, next to the building. My car was parked there, and my housemate was parked behind me, which doesn't block the driveway or any other parking spot, only the one that belongs to me. We've spoken to the owners of the two closest parking spots about it, and they said it's totally fine because we only do it for short periods of time, and anyway, it doesn't block them from getting in or out of their spots. This morning, while we were inside getting boxes, our elderly neighbor from three spots down took offense to the fact that my housemate's car wasn't in an allocated bay. So, he decided to park across two other units' parking spaces to block us in. We came outside, finished packing, and tried to get out around his car, but there wasn't enough room, so we found out whose car it was, and my housemate went to knock on the door. First, he refused to open his door to speak to her, so my housemate, who was deaf, came to get me because she couldn't hear what he was saying with the door between them but she could hear that he was yelling, and she wasn't comfortable. I went to talk to him, and he also yelled at me, through the door and wouldn't open it to speak to me until I specifically asked if he could so we could work it out face to face. Then he initially refused to move his car, and kept saying he was going to call the police and have us fined, despite the fact that he was also parked illegally. I pointed that out, and he told me it was different for him, because, he's an owner. His daughter or granddaughter had to come out, and convince him to just move his car into his unobstructed spot so my housemate could leave. He finally came outside and started pointing at the no visitor parking signs. I apologized and told him that we do live there and that we are moving out, hence why we needed to have both cars there to pack. He refused to believe me. I have met this man several times and introduced myself by name and unit number. I say hello every time I see him around, but I guess he didn't remember my face because he was convinced we were guests and demanding to know who we were visiting and how we got through the gate. I said we used our gate remote. He kept talking over me and asking, where we'd gotten a gate remote and who had given it to us. I said, the real estate, because we live here, and asked if he would like to come to our unit and see all the moving boxes inside to prove that we were who we said we were, and he just walked off. He finally got in his car and moved it into his parking spot, and my housemate left in her car, and I waited for him to finish very, very slowly parking so I could apologize again and thank him for working it out. While I was waiting, his daughter or granddaughter came outside and apologized to me for his behavior. I explained why we were parked like that, and she was really nice and understanding. When he finally finished parking, I went up to him and said thank you and sorry, it won't happen again. He blew straight past me and didn't acknowledge that I was standing there speaking to him at all. It really felt like the way a little kid storms off after losing an argument, and I was pretty shocked to have a fully grown adult behave so rudely, when I was being polite and thanking him, even though he was the only problem in the situation. The kicker is that my housemate's car was nowhere near his parking spot, and not obstructing anything, it just wasn't in an allocated bay. His car, however, was blocking the driveway, two of the neighbor's car parking spots, and at least four cars, but since he's an owner and we're just lowly renters, he fully believed we were the ones in the wrong. I, 27 female, had to leave my boyfriend's, 29 male, house so he could spend the day with his friends. How do I communicate my hurt to him? I, 27 female, recently visited my boyfriend, 30 male, for about a week, which was an opportunity for us to spend time together due to the long distance. During my visit, my boyfriend mentioned that he had planned a day out with his friends. I told him that I'd be fine staying at his place and working on my laptop for the day, as I had a deadline coming up in a few days. However, he started talking about the possibility of his friends coming over to his flat, where I was staying. I sensed that he didn't want me in his house by myself for the day, so I offered to work at a coffee shop, 
not wanting to intrude or be in the way. He dropped me off at the closest town in the morning, and I spent the entire day from around 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. in cafes around town. The last cafe closed at 7 p.m., and trains were on strike, so I texted him and told him I was walking back and would be there in an hour and a half. He didn't get home until 8 p.m. When I got back, I was visibly upset, cold, and wet from the rain. He looked at me and said that next time, he'd let me stay around his. I can't help feeling hurt and neglected, especially because my boyfriend has always emphasized that we should prioritize each other over friends in our relationship. I know I would never do the same to him. It's been weighing heavily on my mind ever since, and I don't know how to communicate this to him. Throughout the week, he also kept asking when I'd booked my ticket to go back, and I couldn't help but feel that he didn't want me there. I want to communicate to him how his actions have hurt me. But, in the past, when I broached the subject of priorities, he becomes defensive and throws his kind acts back in my face, which only makes me more hesitant to open up. How do I communicate my hurt without causing conflict or making him feel attacked? Update. 